Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, I just want to start with a little experiment. So could everybody stand up, please? The first thing I'm going to say is that I am a complete fraud. I don't own a car. So it's very strange for me to be here talking about the future of the car. Can you also sit down if you don't have a car? Yeah, you, that's okay. It counts. It counts. It counts. You can share. You can share. So also sit down if you don't have an electric car or plug-in hybrid or, or just a regular hybrid. Now sit down if you don't have an electric car or a plug-in hybrid. Now sit down if you don't have an electric car. Okay, well, actually, that was quite a nice uh, demographic, and it, more people than I would normally see when I ask that question. So I'm definitely among experts here, which is good to know. Uh, I'm going to start with a short video to set the scene. Uh, and I'm a little bit nervous about the sound, whether it's going to work or not, but we'll, uh, we'll give it a go. We've already made the switch to electricity everywhere else. So why not on the road? The new Renault Fluence ZE is coming soon. 100% electric, 0% emission. There were a number of strange things about that video, particularly why they were allowed to put such a noisy machine in a library. <laughs> but I think the point that Renault were trying to make in that ad was, we've gone electric with everything else, so why don't we do it with cars? But watching that video really hits home, to me anyway, uh, how Renault missed the point. And they, uh, I'm not even sure if they're aware of the irony of that video, because most of our electricity is produced by burning fossil fuels. So actually, that's a very accurate picture of what we do when we use electrical devices right now. They didn't mean it to be, I don't think, uh, from the point of uh, of their ad, but that's the truth right now. So what I'm going to talk about tonight is energy storage, but it is absolutely implicitly coupled with renewable energy. There's no point in doing one without the other. So renewables need energy storage because they're intermittent, but energy storage is only useful if it's storing energy that's produced in a sustainable way. Okay, so I want to make that clear from the start. I don't have all the answers because that's a very big challenge. We've got two big problems decarbonization of energy and air quality. But, and we need to solve both of those. They are, they're killing people. 40,000 people a year in the UK are dying due to air quality related illnesses. And energy and transport make up more than 50% of our CO2 emissions. So two big problems. We need to tackle both renewables and energy storage in tandem. So that's my message from the start. It was good to see some electric and hybrid car owners here. And it, we're definitely on an upward trend. So this is from Next Green Car, showing that we're just approaching 3% of uh, total registrations uh, for electric vehicles. And, that, and you can see the upward trend there. That is definitely going to turn into a hockey stick curve. That is going to increase exponentially. All the drivers are there, if you ex excuse the pun. Uh, the other thing I like about this graph is people are definitely still registering them in March and September. So uh, that's good to see. So I expect this graph to continue on a rapid upward tra trajectory. This is a, a snapshot of what you need to pay at the moment. And it's pretty clear from this slide 
that we need to continue to drive down the cost of these vehicles. The range is pretty decent. It's about to expand dramatically. For example, the Tesla, the next model is going to tip 1,000 kilometers. Uh, but of course, this is not really an affordable price for the average person. So some people can afford them. The Nissan Leaf, the Re Renault Zoe, they're becoming mu much more affordable. But they have durability uh, and lifetime issues. So. That's what we're tackling at NPL. We're, we're working very closely with industry and academia to drive down the cost of this technology. And for reference, about 50% of the cost of the electric vehicle is just in the battery alone. So by tackling the cost of the battery pack, you're tackling the cost of the car. So what is inside one of those battery packs? So anyone who vapes will have seen one of these. This is a lithium ion battery, and this particular one is an 18650 cell. So it's 65 millimeters tall, and its diameter is 18 millimeters. That's where it gets its name from. This is not only used for vaping, this is inside the Tesla. So in the Model S, there are about 7,000 of these cells all across the chassis of the car. And getting the energy in and out of these is pretty efficient. The main challenge is the lifetime. So I always liken electricity to water. It's, it's an analogy that high school teachers use all the time. But uh, electricity and energy storage is very like water. And in fact, that is actually how we store most of our energy at the moment. We pump water uphill, and then we do it at nighttime so it's cheap, and then we release it during the day, and we get the energy back when we need it. Uh, uh, it's the same for a battery, but the problem with a battery is that the faster you try to put the energy in and out of it, the more losses you have because you get resist resistive heating in particular. You also have losses associated with the electrochemical reactions that go on inside this. So fast charging in particular can degrade the life of the battery. So that's a big challenge too, and I'll come to that later. But how does a cell like this work? Let me just talk you through this schematic. So you have two electrodes. It's an electrochemical cell with an electrolyte, which is the green material, in the middle. So you have ions that can transport charge in the electrolyte and electrons that can uh, transport charge in your external circuit. Now, the, the two electrodes are made of different materials. The negative electrode is normally made from a graphite-based material, and the positive electrode is normally a lithium metal oxide. So, the lithium metal oxide is the more noble material. So if you remember your galvanic series from school, you have active materials at one end, like magnesium and aluminium, and you've got noble elements like gold and platinum at the other end. When you connect two of those materials together, uh, a very active one with a very noble one, you get a potential difference, and that's what you can do in a battery. So in this case, we have graphite with intercalated lithium and a lithium metal oxide with intercalated lithium. They have a potential between them of anything between two and four volts. But the lithium and the electrons want to be on the positive electrode. That's where they naturally sit. So to charge the battery, you have to apply an electric current to it to force the electrons where they don't want to be, which is on the negative electrode. So I'll run the video now. You can see the lithium ions are the red circles and the electrons are the blue circles. Lithium ions can migrate through the electrolyte through this white material which is called the separator and that's there just to stop short circuits happening between the two electrodes. Once they get over there, the battery is fully charged. Now you have a situation where you have stored energy. All the charge is stored at the negative electrode it wants to come back here. So as soon as you connect any load to your cell, it could be the drivetrain in a car or the heater in your vaping device, then the reverse process will happen and you'll discharge the cell. So here you can see we've connected it to the external load. The electrons flow back. The lithium ions migrate back through the separator to the positive electrode where they recombine electrochemically. And that's a very 
highly reversible process. The, the losses aren't very big. So you can store most of the energy that you want to store, as long as you do that nice and slowly. These things don't like being stressed. So if you try to do it too quickly, then you'll get degradation of the various components in the cell. And it's managing that and managing the heat that's generated during that process that is the challenge for these systems integrators. I guess why I'm talking to you here today is because batteries in particular are big news. The government has invested a quarter of a billion over four years in what's called the Faraday Challenge. So just out of interest, could you put up your hand if you've heard of the Faraday Challenge? Okay, quite a few of you. Uh, but it's probably something that needs to be publicized a little bit more, because everybody didn't put up their hand. But this is a big initiative going on in the UK at the moment. And as you can see from here, the vision is to become a big player in battery manufacture. At the moment, most batteries are manufactured in the Far East or in the USA. The problem is we have a big automotive industry in the UK. 1.7 million cars manufactured here every year. And most of them are exported. So it's very important to the economy. The view at the moment is that if we don't uh, co-locate battery manufacturing beside our plants, they'll move abroad. So in fact, just to save our own automotive industry and keep it alive, we need to invest in battery manufacturing. Otherwise, it doesn't have a future. And the automotive manufacturers within the UK are beginning to realize that, hence this investment, which is co-funded by industry. I've put this slide up just to show you how many degradation mechanisms there are inside a lithium-ion cell. I'm not going to go through them all, but I hope you can see from it that there are a lot of things that can go wrong. Most of them are materials-based, and the search goes on for materials that are more and more resistant to this type of degradation. And at NPL, we're studying quite a few of these. We can't look at them all, but fortunately, across the world, there are lots of strong university groups looking at uh, various of these degradation mechanisms. But I thought I'd just put this up. It's a nice diagram that was produced by the uh, Energy Storage Group at the University of Oxford. I think that that Ironically, the batteries died. Yeah, <laughs> fantastic. Uh, graph wasn't produced by me. It's a, a very fine drawing from the Energy Storage Group at the University of Oxford. So I should give them some credit for that. But now I'm going to talk a little bit about work we've done at NPL in this area ourselves. And this is about looking inside batteries as they explode. So it was actually quite fun to do. We blew up a lot of 18650 cells doing this. The challenge was that to look inside a battery in real time on the time scales of thermal runaway, and for those of you that don't know what thermal runaway is, you may remember the Samsung mobile phone fires. Uh, and the Boeing Dreamlining, Dreamliner battery fires, they were caused by thermal runaway. Uh, and it's basically a, a positive feedback loop where a, a small flaw in the cell, like a short circuit, causes local heating. That causes decomposition of the electrolyte, which is exothermic, releases heat. And it's a chain reaction which ends with the cell exploding. Uh, and it is a major issue for lithium-ion batteries because they generate a lot of heat, they have unstable chemical components, and if everything isn't managed properly, particularly the current and the temperature, then there's a chance that they can explode. So when you go to bigger and bigger batteries in cars, for example, storing a lot of energy, the danger becomes magnified. So we're very interested in looking at the mechanisms of this, but, but these things happen in less than one second. So I'll show you some examples really s with the time really slowed down so you can see how quick they are, that you can explode one of these in much less than one second. So to look inside at that kind of time scale, you need a very bright beam of, of x-rays. So to do that, we went to the European Synchrotron in Grenoble in France, and we set up an experiment. Uh, and I should mention that this work was carried out uh, as part of a joint PhD studentship with NPL and University College London uh, in um, the Electrochemical Innovation Lab there, which uh, the two supervisors of the student were Dan, Brett, and Paul Shearing, and the student's name was Donald Finnegan, who's a, a fellow Irishman who's now gone on to work for NASA, so he's done very well uh, in his early career. And what Donald did in this experiment was 
to fire an X-ray beam through a battery as we pointed a heat gun at the external surface. And as you can see, the synchrotron people didn't like the idea of this happening around their very expensive equipment. So we had to build a protective cell uh, to basically shield the equipment from the explosion. So these windows were there to allow the heat gun to look in and also the uh, X-ray beam. So this is an example from cell one. So again, it's just one of these 18650 cells. We were rotating it very fast, uh, and we were firing the X-ray beam through. And this is just looking at this part of the cell here. And as you can see, the electrolyte in between the electrode sandwich starts to de decompose and form gas bubbles. And then the structure of the electrode breaks down. And what you can see there, is those white globules are actually bits of copper that have melted. The melting point of copper is 1,080 degrees Celsius. And yet, just a few centimeters away, less than a centimeter away, the rest of the cell is undamaged. So there is a huge temperature gradient in that part of the cell. And this is the first time anyone had looked inside one of these cells when this process was happening. So this is you know, a very interesting mechanism. And we've used this technique now to look at improving safety features of these types of cells. So that's one cell. You might notice inside this cell, there's what's called a mandrel. And this is a central structural support around which the Swiss roll of the battery is wound. So I'm going to show you what happens when one of these cells doesn't have one of these. So this is another commercial cell. No mandrel. We do the same experiment. And you can see from the time scale here, time is moving very slowly. And in about 0.1 of a second, we've destroyed the structure of the cell. It's caved in upon itself because it didn't have that structural support in the middle. What did it look like afterwards? There's cell one. The mandrel's been bashed about a bit. There's a bit of damage. But most of the cell actually stayed intact. The damage that, that we saw in the video is further down. This one, on the other hand, got completely destroyed. So again, this shows that actually including the mandrel is definitely a good idea from a structural point of view. It does have some downsides from the point of view of gas evolution, but again, that's, that's for the designers to worry about. Now the next video I'm going to show you I, I quite like. This is hammering a nail into a lithium ion battery. So again, time is slowed down, and the nail is just bashed into the surface on, on the flat side of the cell. So as you can see, the same sort of process is happening. You're getting localized heating because the nail is making a short circuit between the negative electrode and the positive electrode. However, because the nail is so big and it's such a big heat sink, the effect on the cell actually isn't as bad as if, as if you had a local short circuit. So at this point, we decided to team up with NASA and the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in the USA because they had just invented a very clever device called an internal short-circuiting device. So now our collaborative group has got a little bit bigger. There's us, there's UCL, there's NASA, there's NREL, and we did this work again at the European Synchrotron in Grenoble. And what's clever about this device is it's trying to replicate a, sh a local short circuit in one of these 18650 cells. Now, hammering a nail through one is a very literally a blunt instrument. It doesn't really replicate the type of failure that you get in real life. This doesn't exactly replicate it either, but it's a heck of a lot closer. So what we have is we take a small hole in the separator material, and we put a little bit of wax between a copper pad and an aluminum pad. And that wax melts at 57 degrees. Then all we need to do to generate this kind of induced short circuit is to heat the battery up to 57 degrees, which is what we did. And we can put this little device anywhere we want inside one of these cells. So we had a special cell made. We had two, in fact, with, with this device located 
somewhere in between the sidewall and the central mandrel. And then, as I said, we heated up the battery. This layer of wax melted. These things made contact. And then you got a local short circuit between the copper negative electrode and the aluminium positive electrode. And I'll show you what happened in the next slide. This was really exciting because in the video I showed you the first one, we saw the effect of thermal runaway, but we didn't know where it started. Now we know where to shine our X-ray beam exactly in the cell. And so we've pinpointed it here. And you can see for the first time how the thermal runaway propagates. And there had been a lot of argument about which direction it propagates in, and we can show from our work that it definitely propagates along parallel to the current collectors, as you might expect. But there's ver it's very slow to propagate in the radial direction, and also in the azimuthal direction, which is around the radius of the battery. So most of the propagation happens in the longitudinal direction, and this was the first time anyone had managed to see it. So this was a really nice bit of work, uh, and I'm actually quite proud of Donal, uh, because he was a PhD student who did this work. He put an application into the Engineers Collaborate to Innovate Award, and we all thought, you'll never win that. The year before, it had been won by the consortium that built the two largest warships that the UK had ever produced, the Queen Elizabeth warships. And we went to the awards dinner, and we were blown away. We won for this work. And until about a month ago, I was really proud of this, until I read that the warships had started taking on water. <laughs> and I had had to go back to dry dock. So yeah, it, it, it kind of took the gloss off it a little bit. So we've done some nice science, but how can we use it to actually improve these cells? So the next thing I'm going to show you is a, a similar experiment we did to look at the safety features in the cell. So inside the cap of this battery, there's some quite nice engineering to keep you safe. If you're driving your Tesla car and you have 7,000 of these, you can't even afford for one of them to go wrong because the whole chassis is covered in them. If one goes on fire and you get a chain reaction, you will be sitting on a, on a blazing inferno. And I don't, I, I don't want that to happen because the first person to experience it is going to be famous for very wrong reasons. So it's really important that we keep trying to improve the safety of these, particularly as the manufacturers are always trying to increase the amount of energy they can cram in here, making them even more dangerous. So you've got a few safety features here in the cap. This is called a current interrupt device, and it's a little bit of material here that if you get decomposition of your electrolyte due to heat, and chemical reaction, you'll get a buildup of gas inside the cell. So you, you can see with heavily degraded laptop batteries, for example, they start to bulge. And that's because you're getting gas buildup inside. If the gas buildup gets too much, it will pop this little bit upwards, disconnect it from the terminal here, and it will cut the current. That's why it's called a current interrupt device. So that's one level of protection. The next level is a bursting disk. If the pressure gets too high, this thing will blow, and the entire contents of the cell will be vented out. Now, there are pros and cons to doing that. You want to make sure it's pointing somewhere that isn't uh, dangerous. But uh, That's what designers try to mitigate against. And then the final one is called a positive temperature coefficient device. And this, again, is quite clever. It's a material that, when you heat it up, its resistance gets lower and lower. So if you get a thermal runaway process happening and the battery starts to get really hot, the resistance of this connector will drop and the current will drop proportionally. Now these things aren't perfect. They, they work to some extent, but as you'll see when I run the video, and again, we're being, we're being really abusive to these batteries. We're, we're not giving them much of a chance. You'll see gas start to build up here and then it reaches the point where the whole contents of the cell are ejected outwards with burning. Uh, the contents of a lithium-ion battery do not like seeing water or oxygen. They will go on fire. So we did this experiment in a nitrogen cabinet. In real life, it would produce a, a wall of flame above the battery. 
So again, I, I'm not going to show it in this talk, but we we built another cell. Uh, maybe if I just talk through what one of the issues is here. One of the issues is here that if you get material flying up towards the vent, it can actually block the vent, which is what happens there. We got material blocking our vent when our bursting disk was had, had blown, and they, it sealed the vent again. And that allowed the pressure to build up to an even higher value, where eventually it exploded. So what we looked at was trying to put a vent in the other end as well. So we had a special cell built with a vent in each end, and we repeated this type of experiment, and we showed quite conclusively that having two vents in the cell made it a lot less likely to eject its contents, because it's very hard to block both vents. So that's something that we fed back to the manufacturers, people like Panasonic, LG, and Sony who are making these. Uh, but again, it shows how useful this technique is in improving safety of these batteries. So I'm, I'm going to move on from batteries in a minute, but I just wanted to mention that at NPL we've recently conducted quite a detailed consultation with industry, academia, government and research institutes, all of the key stakeholders in the battery industry in the UK, to identify measurement needs within the industry that are preventing progress and uh, things that we need to overcome to reduce the cost, improve the lifetime, improve the safety, uh, and increase the range of battery vehicles. And these were the five main uh, summary points. Quality control in manufacturing, ways of monitoring state of health of batteries, predicting battery performance and lifetime, identifying end-of-life thresholds for second life and recycling, and establishing standards for state estimation to generate more reliable and comparable data. And we're in the process of putting together quite a large research program, both internally at NPL and in collaboration with our university and industry partners, and we will be participating quite wholeheartedly in the Faraday Challenge as it evolves. So it's a very exciting area, it's a, it's a great place to be working, but there is a lot to do, not just from an electrochemistry point of view, but we have experts in temperature measurement, dimensional measurement, surface chemistry, modeling, and data analytics, to name but a few and we've pulled all these people together to work on these problems. So it's going to be a, an interesting few years. This infographic kind of neatly captures the measurement needs that we've identified through this consultation. I'm not going to go through it all now, but it's loosely um, grouped into manufacturing issues, in-service issues, and end of life. And I'd encourage you to have a look on our website and, and download the report for yourself. But what I want to talk about next is hydrogen. So many people see batteries and hydrogen as competing technologies. But I'm going to try and convince you today that both are going to be required. The scale of the problem of decarbonization and cleaning up our air is far too big for one technology alone to be able to solve the problem. So UK hydrogen economy, will it ever happen? This Admittedly, maybe a biased source, UK H2 Mobility, who are an organization driving the progress of hydrogen. But this is their projection of the uptake of fuel cell vehicles and hydrogen refueling stations in the future. So they predict that by 2030 there will be 1.6 million fuel cell vehicles, 254,000 tons of hydrogen produced each year, and over 1,000 hydrogen refueling stations. So to put that in context, at the moment, we have about 50 fuel cell vehicles and about 10 hydrogen refueling stations. So there's a long, long way to go. Another slightly less biased source, E4 Tech and Element Energy, um, have been looking at the projected steps towards achieving this hydrogen economy. And at the moment, we're very much in the preparation phase. But between 2020 and 2025, it will be putting into practice building hydrogen systems and ramping up development of vehicles and fuel cells. So that's when we expect it really to start taking off. And after that, widespread rollout, conversion of the gas grid from methane to hydrogen, hydrogen used in buildings, burning hydrogen, and in vehicles uh, through fuel cells, but potentially also by burning the hydrogen. But this isn't as far away as you think. So there's a very ambitious project happening, happening as we speak 
um, in Leeds. So Northern Gas Networks have pioneered an idea to convert the, the whole city to hydrogen from natural gas. So this will require staged conversion of various parts of the grid, the high pressure grid, the low pressure grid, appliances in everyone's house. But the, the power of hydrogen is because you can burn it and it's much uh, easier to convert someone's house to hydrogen heating rather than electric heating. So KPMG have done a report that showed a significant saving uh, compared to converting the UK, everyone's house, every building, every organization to uh, hydrogen rather than electrical heating. So if you, can, if you can set up a distribution network of hydrogen for use as uh, combustion in people's houses for heating, then that gives you a natural refueling network for vehicles. And I think that is one of the the powerful arguments to say that hydrogen can play a big role in the future energy landscape and Leeds is pioneering in this area. One of the good things about Leeds is there are salt caverns uh, up here near uh, the east coast where you can store large quantities of hydrogen and we're talking enough to manage several days worth of supply and demand and even demand between winter and summer. So. It's, very, it's going to be very interesting to see how this project goes. It looks like they're going to go ahead with it. It hasn't been signed off yet, but uh, it will really be a kind of sign of the future uh, to see whether this works. We're doing our bit at NPL. So I mentioned the 10 refueling stations. We have one on our site in Teddington. It's open to the public. Uh, it's been almost two years running now. Uh, and we also have leased a Toyota Mirai uh, at a very good rate of 500 pounds a month, I might add, with free hydrogen refueling. So it actually, this car pays for itself. Not only is it clean, uh, but it's actually cheaper than having our staff hire uh, a, a rental car from our rental car company. Uh, so it's, it's saving us money and it's carrying our brand around and promoting the technology. So. It's been a very good initiative, and, and we should probably look at getting a few more of these cars, in fact. There isn't much choice, so the hydrogen vehicle slide is noticeably less crowded than the electric vehicle slide, and I, and I had to leave out a lot of the electric vehicles. There are only four available at the moment in the UK. The Hyundai I iX35 and the Toyota Mirai are the main commercial models. You can buy these. And the Honda Clarity and the River Simple Raza you can lease. Uh, they ex expect to have commercial model models for purchase later this year or next year. Uh, and there are models from other manufacturers coming on stream in the next few years. But having driven the Toyota Mirai quite a lot, I can say it is a really nice car. And I'm going to show you a video that one of the students at NPL has made to show our staff how to refuel the car. Um, he is a budding Steven Spielberg, so I had to get him to tone down a lot of the special effects that he put into the video. But uh, hopefully it will give you an idea of how easy it is to refuel a hydrogen car. So the idea is you don't really have to change your habits. This is me, by the way. Uh, embarrassing, but anyway. So this is part of our site in Bushy Park in southwest London. It's a very nice site. This is a refueling station. And again, compared to a battery-powered car, this doesn't feel very different from pulling up to a petrol station. You have your fuel cap here, just covered with a plastic dust cap. And this whole process takes less than five minutes. So a big advantage over having to recharge a battery. Luckily you can't see the pin in this video. So this is a 700 bar refueler. So it takes hydrogen at 1000 bar and it, using the pressure difference, pumps it into a tank that stores the hydrogen at 700 bar in two reinforced tanks at the back of the Mirai. 
you just press the start button. It's as easy as that. Then you unclick it. You might notice that there's some ice on it, and that is because you have to cool the hydrogen to get it into the car. Then you print your receipt, and you'll see 12 pounds per kilogram. Five kilograms is a full tank, so that's about 60 pounds. That gets you 500 kilometers. So it's not far off a regular petrol or diesel car. So uh, I'd like to give credit to Brian Madzima for putting that together. I think he did a great job, and uh, hopefully our staff won't be uh, confused at all about how to refuel the car. So the Toyota Mirai runs on a fuel cell engine. So this is an old technology. Not many people realize, but it was invented in 1839. Uh, it works through an electrochemical reaction. And because you're not burning the fuel, there's no thermodynamic Carnot limitation. So you can get high efficiency out of the car, up to 60% efficiency. And that compares with between 15 and 20% when you burn the fuel. So how does it work? Well, again, like a battery, you have two electrodes. You have your anode on the left-hand side, your negative electrode, and your cathode on the right-hand side, your positive electrode. If you feed hydrogen to your anode, it gets split into protons and electrons on the surface of the electrode, which is made up of very fine platinum nanoparticles dispersed on high surface area carbon. Then the key to the operation of the cell is this membrane at the center, a proton exchange membrane. And that's a material that conducts protons, but not electrons. And because the electrons can't pass through it, you can force them through an external circuit, generating power. And then at the other electrode, everything combines with oxygen from the air to form water. So you take hydrogen and oxygen, you create water, and you take the electricity out in a very efficient way. It's completely silent, no moving parts. Uh, and it, it's very like a battery, except rather than storing all of the energy inside the battery, you have an inert uh, cell, and you supply the energy and the fuel from outside. So as long as you keep supplying fuel to it, it will keep going. And one of the big advantages that hydrogen has over batteries is you can put the hydrogen into the tank in about five minutes. So it doesn't have this problem of if you try to cram all the energy into this small box, the box doesn't like it. The tank will take as much as you want to put in. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about what we've done in this area at NPL. I'm not going to dwell on the technical details, but please feel free to ask me later. So most of our work is focused on the development of in situ measurement techniques, modeling tools, and standard test methods to, again, make the technology cheaper, more robust, increase the lifetime, and um, inform manufacturers about how to design, op optimize the design uh, of future systems. So we've worked on techniques for measuring the active catalyst area, which gives you an idea of how quickly the cell is degrading. We've invented a reference electrode, of which I'll show you an example shortly. We've measured relative humidity and temperature in an operating cell. We've looked at corrosion of the metallic bipolar plates, which is one of the key components of the cell. And we've done some work which shows that the way people were thinking about it was completely wrong. And we've modeled the process in uh, the software platform Comsol. So I'm going to talk a little bit about reference electrodes. Reference electrodes are the standard laboratory technique when you have an electrochemical cell with two electrodes in it. And the potential of that cell changes due to some process. It could be performance. It could be degradation. You don't know whether one electrode's potential is changing or the other one or both combined. When you put a third electrode in there and you measure the potential of each electrode against that third reference electrode, then you can identify wh what's happening at each electrode. And that's very important in electrochemical systems such as batteries, fuel cells, and electrolyzers, as you'll see. 
the standard hydrogen electrode is the main uh, thermodynamically defined as zero electrode, and all of the other common laboratory electrodes are measured against that one. And that's the one that we've used in our work. So in a fuel cell, you have an anode, a cathode, and a membrane. Then you have a gas diffusion layer to feed the gas through from each side, and a flow field plate or bipolar plate to uh, flow the gas into the gas diffusion layer. Reference electrodes to measure the anode and cathode potential have been used for many decades. And there have been two main types. An edge type, where you just clip the reference electrode onto the edge of the membrane, way outside the cell. And the sandwich type, where you insert a reference electrode right into the middle of the membrane and press two membranes together to give you uh, a sandwich electrode. Neither of these reference electrodes is that reliable. The edge type one is too far away, so there's a big potential drop between here and the potential of the electrodes that you're trying to measure. The sandwich type one is better, it's closer to the action, but it's perturbed. Uh, there, 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 is a, there is a potential drop here, so it's not, it, it doesn't take that into account. It needs to be right up at the electrode surface to avoid that. But also, the presence of the reference electrode itself interferes with what you're trying to measure, because it's right there inside the membrane. So our approach was quite simple. We inserted our reference electrode through the end plates of the cell, so that it made contact with the electrode at the back and didn't suffer any potential drop and gave you an accurate measurement of the potential at that point in the cell. It's a really simple idea, but no one had done it before for some reason. So this is a schematic of how we set it up. This is our external reference electrode for making the measurement. We used a salt bridge, which was a piece of naphion tubing. Naphion is the material of the membrane. So remember that it's ion conducting, but not electron conducting. We drilled holes all the way through the cell. And then to make the ion conducting path through the gas diffusion layer, we doped it with some naphion powder. So this way, we had an ion conducting path all the way from our reference electrode to the surface of the fuel cell electrode, whether it be anode or cathode. And this allows us to make an array of these. So we made a 3x3 three three array across the active area of the cell. And you can see the nine reference electrodes poking out here. And this is what it looked like in practice. A complete mess, but here's our fuel cell. Here's our nine reference electrodes. And there's all the nine tubes going in through the end plates. So I'm going to show you the measurements. Again, the mechanism that we're looking at here is quite complicated, so I'm not going to go through it in detail. But suffice it to say, where you see the potential jumping up, that's the part of the electrode that's corroding during a startup of the fuel cell. And like batteries, like fuel cells, like electrolyzers, if you want to just run them at a constant current, they will last forever. What they don't like is the current going up, current going down, start, stop, on, off. The materials in these systems don't like that at all. That's what causes degradation. So we were very interested in startup and shutdown. And you can see from our potential measurements, we could locate inside the cell where the corrosion was happening during startup uh, and for how long. So you'll notice during startup, this part of the cell is suffering the most corrosion. When we go to shutdown, we'll see the opposite happens. So actually, it, in terms of where it's best to be in the cell, it's probably somewhere in the middle. As we see the most carbon corrosion, remember we have high surface area carbon supporting our catalyst material. And when we get corrosion of that carbon, we get loss of active surface area of the cell, which is one of the major reasons that the performance of the cell decays with time. We also measured the amount of carbon dioxide that was coming out of the cell as a result of this carbon corrosion. And we could see that startup was definitely worse than shutdown. And this tied in with the potentials that we were measuring in the experiment. 
So what use was this? What, what does knowing this let us do? Well, we were investigating a way of mitigating this type of carbon corrosion by applying a small load across the cell on startup and shutdown. And when you do that, you can significantly reduce the amount of carbon corrosion that you see. And as you'll see, particularly on shutdown, it's a very effective way of stopping this carbon corrosion from happening. So if we look at our potential measurements, I'll just flick between them. But these are our startup measurements at three different relative humidities in the cell. And these are our shutdown measurements of the nine reference electrodes. So if I, fl if I flick between them, you can see that applying this small load really drops the potential significantly that you see on startup and particularly on shutdown. On shutdown, it nearly gets rid of it completely. So this is an effective way of solving the problem. Now, we published this work, but we did lots of other work for companies where we looked at their proprietary ways of getting around this problem. And we showed that some of these were even better than this, but unfortunately, I can't show them to you. But it, 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 it was a very useful and cheap technique for improving how you get around this type of startup shutdown problem. So the last thing I'm going to talk about tonight is electrolyzers. An electrolyzer is how we produce the hydrogen. So inside our refueling station at NPL, we have one of these. We supply water and electricity to an electrolyzer, and it's just like a fuel cell working in reverse. So at the anode, the water is converted into oxygen, and the hydrogen ions then travel through the membrane and form hydrogen at the cathode. So the cathode is where we collect all the hydrogen. We could keep the oxygen if we wanted to, but actually there's no, it, there's no commercial reason at the moment to keep it, so it's just vented to the atmosphere. But on this side, we then compress the hydrogen up to 1,000 bar in a big tank, and then we can dispense it in five minutes into each car. Our refueling station at NPL can refuel 18 cars each day. And it's a modular system, so you can just keep putting these containers into the station as more and more cars come on stream. So again, with this reference electrode design, no one had ever applied this type of reference electrode to this type of electrolyzer. Again, I couldn't believe they hadn't. And with just some simple experiments at NPL, we changed industry's view of how degradation was happening in these systems. So when you switch off an electrolyzer, people were seeing this even in the commercial refueling stations. The open circuit potential, this is the drop that you immediately get due to the ohmic drop. So as you switch off the current, the potential drops. And then you would expect the potential just to sit here. But what they saw in practice was the potential dropped with time. And when that's happening, you know something isn't right. So there's some chemical reaction happening there. And it's, it was leading to degradation of performance of these refueling stations. And nobody could explain what it was. So we used our reference electrode in a single cell like this. So it's replicating on a small scale what they have inside the refueling station. And that way, we were able to split this cell voltage into the anode potential and the cathode potential. Everyone in industry said, the anode will be the problem. They were wrong. The anode potential stayed pretty much rock steady the whole time. And it was actually the cathode potential that was rising with time, causing the cell potential, which is the difference between them, to drop. And what we showed in this work was, what was happening was, when you, you're generating hydrogen here, when you switch it off, oxygen from the anode is actually diffusing across and raising the potential of the cathode. And we knew from our fuel cell research that that leads to degradation of the platinum cathode. And that's what we saw. So this allowed us to then say to them, we need better materials for our anodes and cathodes. And we developed an accelerated stress test. Now, this is actually unpublished work. So I'm taking a big risk by putting it up here. But we are hoping to submit it in the next couple of weeks. So I don't think anyone else will have time to do all this work again. But what this shows, I won't explain in detail why, 
we saw as we cycled the potential of the cathode, this small peak starting to appear in what's known as a diagnostic of the surface area of the platinum cathode. And the reason we were able to do this diagnostic is because we had this reference electrode capability. And this shows very sensitively, and for the first time, that the catalyst material on the anode side is actually very slowly and in very small quantities coming across the membrane, particularly during shutdown of these cells. So this technique will be used in a very sensitive way to identify not just better cathode materials, but more stable anode materials that won't show this type of degradation. So again, we're working very closely with the electrolyzer manufacturers on this. So I'm going to end now by, again, saying that similar to the battery consultation that we did, the previous year we did a consultation with the hydrogen industry. And we identified a number of areas. Uh, I think the hydrogen one covered a, a much broader range of uh, issues. So we had the issues of material development that I've just talked about, but also odorants for hydrogen, putting in uh, hydrogen mixed with natural gas in the grid, because we might not go straight from 0% uh, hydrogen to 100%. It might be blended for a while. Combustion properties of hydrogen, if we're going to have hydrogen appliances in everyone's house. Uh, looking at how compatible the materials of containment are for, for hydrogen with hydrogen transportation, and of course, hydrogen storage. We don't really want to have 1,000 bar tanks of hydrogen. We'd much rather have a solid state store. But those guys have been working on it for decades, and they're still not quite cracking it. So again, I, I would encourage you to go and have a look at this report, the two reports which are on our web, website, the batteries one and the hydrogen one, which will give you more information on what we'll be working on in the future. And that's it. Thank you very much for listening.